All right, tonight's um, video is on three different components um, in our poetry unit. Uh, tonight's focus will be on rhyme scheme, rhythm, and meter. All right, so when we talk about um, rhyme scheme, students often have trouble with rhyme scheme because they think of the word scheme as a plan or a plot. Uh, so for example, the gang scheme for breaking into the museum includes disguises. Now that's not the type of scheme that we're referring to. In a um, poetic sense, scheme has another definition. When we're talking about scheme, we're talking about uh, the rhyme arrangement, how the poem is arranged based on the use of rhyme in the actual poem. So that's what we're going to talk about in today's lesson. So when we're talking about rhyme scheme, we're going to use this example from William Shakespeare's Sonnet 65. And pretty much the rhyme scheme is very easy. So what you do is you look at the N words. And each of these N words are associated with a particular letter, which will denote the actual rhyme scheme. So... If you notice, they're all color-coded, and the colors will also associate with the actual rhyme scheme. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Okay, so this is the rhyme scheme. So if you look at this um, example, it says the first line is, Since brass, nor stone, nor earth, nor boundless sea. So the since it ends in C, and it's the first. And actually, when you're talking about a rhyme scheme, the first line is always going to be A. Okay, so we're going to give this line A. All right, the next line, but sad mortality or sways their power. Now, power does not rhyme with C. So we're going to give this the letter B. Now, line three, how with this rage shall beauty hold a plea? Now, plea rhymes with C, so we're going to give it the same letter. So that's going to be A. So, so far the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, whose action is no stronger than a flower. Now, flower rhymes with power. So this gets a letter B for the rhyme scheme. And as you can see, all the words are color-coded. So when you have a new word that doesn't rhyme with either of the previous words, it gets the next letter. So out does not rhyme with flower or plea, so it gets the letter C. So you notice as the poem continues, it gets more letters. So this is the rhyme scheme. It's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So that is the rhyme scheme for this particular poem. Now that rhyme scheme can actually change uh, from poem to poem. It just depends on the author's preference. You could have a rhyme scheme that is totally A, B, A, B, A, B, or you could have a rhyme scheme that's A, B, B, A, which is a particular type of poem that we'll get to uh, later in our next uh, video. But um, if you look here, it says it is a regular rhyme scheme because the first and third line of each quatrain, which is a four-line poem, uh, rhyme. So the one, two, three, four. So A, B, A, B, which is a quatrain. And then it says, as do the second and fourth. The final couplet also rhymes. So here's your couplet. Two lines is actually a couplet, so take that note down. So you have a quatrain, which is a four-line stanza, and you have a couplet, which is a two-line stanza. But the question is, okay, so I get what rhyme scheme is, but what good does it do for me? So we'll talk about that. So when you think about rhyme scheme, you have to think about it being like a secret code that you have to unlock. Um, so if you look here, Shakespeare always find uh, his sonnets always follow the same form. So all his poems all have 14 lines. There are three quatrains that express related ideas. And then there's an ending couplet that kind of sums up the author's point or makes a conclusion. And the rhyme scheme is almost always the same. So when you're looking at rhyme scheme, you can actually look at the last two lines once you understand Shakespeare's rhyme scheme that kind of summarizes the author's point or makes a conclusion. 
Um, if you look here, it says the first quatrain points out that hard objects and even the C are changed over time. So he talks about that here. So the ideas, the major ideas are grouped based on the rhyme scheme for William Shakespeare. Whereas the second quatrain gives more examples. And this is kind of the pattern that you'll see with Shakespeare. And then the third quatrain, he wonders how beauty can hide from time. And then as I said in the last couplet, this is again the summary of the main point or the message of the conclusion that the author wants to make. So understanding a rhyme scheme in many instances can um, give you a sense of the author's message and the pattern and the style in which he or she writes. Okay, so this second part, I've got rhythm, I've got music. Um, so we've talked before about illusions. We don't need to cover that, but if, you, if we need to further elaborate on that, we'll talk about that in our next video. Um, rhythm is the musical quality of language produced by repetition, especially in poetry. And this is called verse. Many literary elements contain or create rhythm, such as alliteration, which we've talked about before, sonnets, consonants, meter, repetition, and rhyme. Now, meter is generally the regular pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables in poetry. So you have words that are stressed and you have words that are not stressed. Obviously, for effect, for style purposes, depends on the author's writing style. Um, so let's look. Um, say you're good at music. And you want to create some music with a certain beat. So this would be one example would be love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub. So obviously that could get annoying doing that every time you wanted to ask for a certain rhythm. So there is actually an easier way to make that rhythm or beat. So here you have a beat that has five different measures or units to it. So you have one, two, three, four, five. Now, each unit or measure is made up of two separate beats, which gives you a total of 10 total beats. All right, the first beat is softer than the second, and you can see that with uh, the little uh, annotations above it. So you have the unaccented and accented, which actually translate to stressed and unstressed syllables. So lub, dub, you can hear it, lub, dub. So the dub part is the stressed part of the line, whereas the lub part is the unstressed or unaccented portion. Um, so that's all we need to um, cover for that part, because I wanted to get into, um, and we don't need to cover this as a little bit more complex. Now, here is the portion that we wanted to look at, the stressed and unstressed portion. So for example, let's look at this line right here. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. Now when you read that out loud, you should be able to hear the difference between the stress and the unstressed words. So, but soft, soft is stressed. What light through yonder window breaks. So you can hear the words that are being stressed. Now the question is, why are they being stressed? Typically, and you probably need to write this down. Poets use stressed and unstressed words for effect within their poems. They use it to emphasize important words. They use it to convey a message. So there is a reason for words being stressed and unstressed. It's just like when rappers, you know, put together their lines and their lyrics, they stress and emphasize certain words within their song for effect for rhythm purposes, for you know, a variety of different reasons. And you want to make sure you're able to identify the difference between an unstressed syllable and a stressed syllable, like literally saying it out loud, hearing it, and that's the best way to do it because on, on tests that you may take, they may ask you to identify which words are stressed and unstressed. So keep in mind, a stressed syllable, the word, or the sound of the word has more emphasis, whereas an unstressed syllable has less emphasis on the word. So if you, another example would be, so when you read this line, but soft, you can hear the emphasis on soft. 
what light through yonder window breaks. So you can hear the emphasis on the words based on their stress. All right, so again, how does understanding meaning help you understand a poem? If the meter is very simple, like a children's book, that will help you know the message or the theme of the poem is probably humorous. A more complicated meter might indicate a more complicated theme, a more complicated message. So just as a poet might change the rhyme scheme for a specific purpose, a change in meter might indicate the poet is trying to change the topic or it could be changing the transition. It could be changing the tone um, for dramatic effect. So like Shakespeare has his noble character speak in iamic, iamic pentameter, but this is the lower characters would speak in regular language. Um, and that's the whole iamic pentameter is another, I'm messing up that word, but it's another whole other discussion. But just keep in mind that oftentimes um, authors will, or rather poets will use the rhyme scheme to switch up the pace in the poem, for dramatic effect in the poem, for also uh, to look at the theme, whether it's a complicated theme, a serious theme, or a humorous theme. All right, so that pretty much concludes our discussion on rhyme, rhythm, and meter. Here you have a few more definitions on alliteration, allusion, again, a sonnets and consonants, a couplet, quatrain, repetition, and rhyme. And we will actually have a continuation of rhyme and rhythm in part two of our uh, training video for Thursday.